Welcome to part three of our story, Shipwrecked. The ship continued to hunt in the whale-rich waters near Japan, but it never sailed close to the shore. Captain Whitfield feared the Japanese might open fire and attack the John Howland, as they had done in 1837 when the American ship Morrison sailed into Edo, what is now Tokyo Bay. He could not risk having his ship destroyed and his men killed or captured. The situation dismayed Manjuro, who wanted to return home. He would willingly have risked his own life to get back to his family, for he feared that they might be suffering because he could not provide for them. But he realized the captain could not jeopardize the safety of the John Harland and his crew. After catching 19 whales, the captain headed his ship to the Sandwich Islands, Hawaii, for supplies and provisions. When the ship docked at Honolulu's harbor, the island newspaper, called the Polynesian, announced, Arrived. November 20th, 1841, John Howland, New Bedford, 24 months at sea, carrying 1,400 sperm whale oil barrels. The Honolulu of 1841 was a forest of mats, crowded with New England whaling ships and merchant ships from the United States, France, and England. Manjiro and his group were elated, for they had never been to a busy harbor. The castaways were thrilled to disembark and walk along roads lined with shops and taverns. They saw houses where structures were near to them. The frame New England-style wooden homes were occupied by sea captains. The others were occupied by American missionaries who were converting many Hawaiians to Christianity. Captain Whitfield took the castaways to the home of Dr. Garrett P. Judd, an American medical missionary who wielded political power. Dr. Judd had renounced his American citizenship to swear allegiance to the King of Hawaii. As a result, His Royal Highness Kamehameha III appointed Judge as his most powerful personal advisor. This missionary acted as governor of the islands. In 1842, was named prime minister. He made arrangements for the Japanese group to live first at a fort, then at a home in Honolulu. He told them that all their expenses would be paid for by the government. Although Denzo, Gaiman, Jisuki, and Terraman chose to remain in Hawaii, where Dr. Judd assured them comfort and the chance to find jobs, Manjiro decided to stay with the ship. Since he could not return to his homeland, he desperately wished to shape his life under the captain's guidance. He wanted to become a qualified navigator. Captain Whitfield, who was childless, widower at this time, ached to act as this remarkable boy's foster parent. He was elated at the prospect of having Manjiro return home with him. After arranging for the whale oil to be transferred to other ships so that it could be taken to ports in the United States, and having stocked the John Holland with hogs, fresh fruit, and water, Captain Whitfield ordered his ship to set sail in January 1842. Manjiro became a member of his crew. He was to receive one one-fortieth of the profits as his share. He was now 16 years old. The men spent 16 months on the Pacific Ocean hunting whales. Then after a stopover at the island of Guam for supplies, rounding Cape Horn and sailing among icebergs, they went up along the east coast of the Americas. On May 7, 1843, they arrived at New Bedford, Massachusetts. The John Howland had been away from its home port for three years and seven months. Manjiro had been away from his homeland for two and a half years. By bringing Manjiro, Captain Whitfield introduced Americans to a boy who had come from the locked-up land of mystery, the isolated empire of Japan. Manjiro was to be baffled by the strangeness of an alien world, the United States. Manjiro was the first Japanese person to set foot in the United States. After disembarking, Captain Whitfield took Manjiro to the Seaman's Bethel Church to offer prayers of thanks for their safe, successful voyage. Then he took the boy across the first drawbridge Manjiro had ever seen in his life. It spanned the Achusnit River, connecting New Bedford with the small town of Fairhaven on the other side of the harbor. They headed for the home of Eben Akin, a former officer on one of Whitfield's whalers. Because the captain had to leave for New York City to find buyers for oils and bones, he asked Akin to provide a temporary home for Manjiro. 
The kin was keen about keeping their foreign boy, and so arrangements were made. Whitfield not only paid for board, but also arranged for a kin to enroll the boy at the town stone schoolhouse on Bread and Cheese Lane. Manjiro, at the age of 16, had never attended a school in his life. He would begin his formal education in a one-room schoolhouse among 30 children who ranged in age from 4 to 16. Until his body became accustomed to a sitting position, Manjiro found being seated on a bench behind a desk very uncomfortable. In Japan, people kneeled on the floor and sat back on their heels. Chairs and benches were never used. As a unique alien, Manjiro was, was a curiosity to many folks. However, their interest in him did not compare to the enchantment he experienced when he saw the strange sights surrounding him. He was truly in a new world. Never before had he seen magnificent mansions, glorious gardens, and sky-hurt high church steeples. The elegant section of town where families made rich from whale oil lived was high on a hill above the wharves. Men in high silk hats and long-tailed coats walked alongside women in bonnets and long, twisted-waisted gowns. Tight-waisted gowns. Manjiro had become familiar with Western dress while he was in Hawaii, but he had never seen clothes as elaborate and elegant as those worn by well-to-do New Englanders. At times, a gentleman held a woman's arm as he helped her across the road. In Japan, women did not walk with men. They followed behind them, and touching the arm of a female in public was considered crude. Close to the waterfront, there were warehouses for whale products, stores for butchers, bakers, and candle makers, and shops for harpoons, hardwood hammocks, and thousand other things. Oil barrels were piled high on the wharves. They also lied the long lanes. Author whaler Herman Melville had lived in New Bedford. He wrote that the town itself is a land of oil, where fathers, they say, give whales for dowries to their daughters. Whale oil was used as currency. Teachers and ministers were sometimes paid with barrels of oil instead of cash. Although the stench of whale oil was offensive to some outsiders, to those who lived there, the smell was perfume that enhanced the well-being of the whole town. New Bedford at that time was the greatest whaling port in the world. Taverns and boarding houses were filled with young men and old salts from all over the world. Streets swarmed with seamen from the islands of the Pacific, as well as those from Africa and Europe. Local country boys yearning to go to sea intermingled with them. The young American hayseeds listened eagerly to mariners' tales about the allure of faraway lands. The challenge of fighting sea monsters, the spell of the sea. Rarely did they want to hear about the hard work, poor food, and the desperately lonely life aboard a ship that wouldn't return to home port for three or four years. Captain Whitfield's business trip lasted two months. During that time, he had courted and married Albertina Keith, an attractive, gentle woman. The captain built a house outside of Fairhaven and started the farm. Manjiro was thrilled to move in with the newlyweds. The house had unique features not found in Japan. He saw things such as glass windows, not translucent paper windows, separate rooms for sleeping, eating, and lounging, not one all-purpose room, solid interior walls, not sliding screens made of paper. He saw chairs not found in Japanese homes where people sat on the floor. Beds, not straw mats on the floor. Pillows, not a bag of grain or a log for a headrest. Whale oil candles, not candles made from the resin of a pine tree. Tin and glass lanterns, not paper or wood lanterns. Manjiro was amazed that Captain Whitfield owned 14 acres of land. In Japan, only noblemen controlled more than a small plot of ground. Manjiro enjoyed farming, an occupation forbidden to him in Japan, and he loved riding horseback, an activity denied to anyone in this country who was not a samurai or a daimyo lord. After school and during the summers, he harvested vegetables and tended horses. He noted that neighboring farmers raised cattle for milk and beef. In Japan, Cattle were not milked or butchered. The thought of drinking something produced by animals 
seemed unclean, and eating beef was against the law in his country. Their cattle was used for pulling carts and carrying loads. The Whitfields loved Manjiro as their own son. How proud they were to learn their, their boy was a brilliant student, ready for more advanced studies. They enrolled him at Bartlett's Academy, a school in Fairhaven that gave courses in navigation and surveying the curriculum was geared to train future mariners who might become ship officers and captains. Although some looked at askance at a foreign face, they seemed to, out of place in the school. They catered to sons of New England shipmasters and ship owners. Others respected Manjuro for his superior mind and winning personality. He was the brightest student in the class. A friend described him as shy and quiet in his demeanor, adding that John Mung fairly soaked up learning. After two and a half years at Bartlett's, Manjuro decided he was old enough to earn his own keep. He became a live-in apprentice for Mr. William, Hussey, a great character who made casks for keeping oil. Manjuro was overworked and underfed by William Hussey. After six hunts, he became so ill that he had to move back to the Whitfield farm, where the concerned captain and his wife nursed him back to health. Although grateful and loving towards the Whitfields, Manjuro longed for the affection, attention, and approval of his mother, and he often thought about his life in Japan. He dreamed of returning to his homeland and telling his family about some of the strange customs of Americans. He had written the following comments. When a young man wants to marry, he looks for a young woman for himself without asking a go-between to find one for him, as we do in Japan. American men and women make love openly. They kiss in public. Women do not use paint or powder on their faces. And American women have quaint customs. For instance, some of them make a hole through their lobes of their ears and run a gold or silver ring through this hole as an ornament. A mother gives all of things cow's milk as a substitute for mother's milk. But it is true that no ill effects of this strange habit, ha habit have been reported. Eggs, oil, and salt mixed with flour is good food. They call it bread. A man takes off his hat when paying a visit. He does not remove his shoes. A man and his host shake hands to greet each other. He never bows. A man sits on a chair instead of a floor. Ordinary men carry watches. When walking, they carry canes inside of which swords are often hidden. Houses have glass windows instead of oiled translucent paper and woolen carpets instead of straw mats, which are woven by machines. Officials are hard to distinguish as they never have to display the authority of their office. They don't dress distinctively to show their superior power, and no one has to bow to them. As an adopted member of a family, he reflected his feelings by writing, Families are peaceful and affectionate. The happiness of their homes is not matched in other countries. It was 1846, the peak year for the American whaling. There was such a demand for inexperienced hands that the ship captains had a hard time finding qualified men. Captain Ira Davis of the whaler Franklin found the task especially difficult because he ran a religious ship. They observed the fat Sabbath and forbade grog, the liquor that kept most whalers in high spirits. Everyone hired had to sign whalesman's shipping paper, which included the following clauses. For officers, no distilled spiritus liquor will be put on board. In case of violation of this pledge by the master of any officer of seamen, his entire share of the voyage shall be thereupon forfeited. For the crew, it shall be the duty of the officer having care of the logbook to note all instances of drunkenness and every instruct a woman put into the ship for immoral, licentious purposes. For every instance of drunkenness, two days' pay shall be forfeited. As an observant Christian ship, the Franklin held Sunday services that were compelled to attend. This was no hardship, since the Sabbath was all day of rest, no wailing allowed. Although its bouts more were sighted, someone kept track of them until Monday. 